Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. Elon Musk claims that Starship may be ready to fly again by Christmas, and although this may indeed be true, the only way that this rocket is going to fly again that soon is if you want to watch it explode for a third time. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Everybody stay tuned because I have a huge giveaway coming up on this channel. I'm going to be giving away a piece of Starbase and everybody has a chance to win. So stay tuned for all of that. In the meantime, let's talk about Starship, let's talk about OFT3, and when it's likely to happen, and what Elon has to say about it. I don't think I'd like to work for Elon. I mean, he sets his team up essentially for failure every time he gets on Twitter. He makes announcements of completion dates, of ready-to-launch dates that are simply unachievable at this stage in Starship's development. There's no way in hell that Starship is going to be ready for another launch in three to four weeks and have a reasonable chance of success. Yes, the rocket is practically complete at this point. Yeah, it'd be a relatively simple thing to do to get it stacked and just launch the damn thing, and it would also be extremely easy to just sit there and watch it explode the same way it did with OFT2. Obviously, this is not what we want to achieve. What we want to achieve is a substantially better performance, hopefully an orbit this next time, or a splashdown off the coast of Hawaii. And how the hell are you supposed to achieve that if you don't take all of the time necessary to go over the date? As you're going to see, there is a hell of a lot of data that SpaceX gathers on every one of these launches. And then once you've gathered the data, you need to analyze it and try to figure out what it all means, exactly what caused not only the destruction of the booster, but the destruction of the orbiter as well. Probably two very different issues that affected each component of the ship. And it could be several issues. It could be hot staging, although though a lot of people think that that's probably not the case. Although, as you're going to see, I don't necessarily agree with that, and I'm going to make my case for that here in a little bit, but it, it doesn't really matter. This information needs to be examined in great detail and thoroughly before we can even think about another launch. And then, of course, once you've identified these issues, then you need to come up with a plan for fixing them on a rocket that is essentially complete or 99% complete right now. It's very difficult to implement significant changes to the propulsion system or to the tanks if it was a slosh issue, those sorts of things. Very difficult indeed to do any of that on a rocket that is largely complete. This entire process certainly is not going to take three to four weeks. The FAA is well aware of that, and they're going to demand a hell of a lot more than three to four weeks worth of process from SpaceX before they're going to give them the go-ahead. But I don't want to give you the impression that the FAA is going to hold all of this up needlessly. They aren't. The FAA wants Starship to complete a successful orbit as much as SpaceX does, because a successful orbit means that the public isn't in danger. But if we rush, or SpaceX, whatever, I like to think that all of us have a shared stake in what's happening here. Therefore, that's why I say we all the time. But if we rush to completion, rush to our next launch without doing everything that's necessary to give the maximum chance of a successful orbit this time, well, the consequences could be very dire, even if the FAA gave the go-ahead against their better judgment. Four, three, two, 
I'm going to keep saying this, Elon, if you want to have a monopoly on SpaceX coverage on X, then fix those damn lag issues. Okay, enough said about that. Let's have a look at the launch and what SpaceX is going to be analyzing. During this stage, of course, they're probably going to be analyzing what exactly went right to make sure that this happens every single time they launch. It is astonishing and incredible incredible accomplishment indeed that SpaceX managed to get all 33 of the engines on Starship to function through the entire boost phase. That is an amazing thing and something, as I've said before, the Soviets were unable to do with N1. So this stage of the launch was as close to flawless as you could have imagined. And really, I don't think there were any problems happening until the actual actual separation process. However, when the separation process got going, that's where the disagreements start. Even though the booster was destroyed a matter of 30 seconds or less after the hot stage separation, most experts concur that it was not the hot stage separation that caused the destruction of the booster, but rather something propulsion system related or more probably a propellant Slosh issue. Now, let me try to explain what all of that means. The reason that SpaceX is going to have to completely refuel Starship before it can go to the moon is because the less fuel you have in a tank, the more it has a tendency to slosh around while the tank is in motion, especially if you're flipping the tank around during the kinds of maneuvers that Super Heavy carries out while it's trying to come back to Earth. This is very very problematic. The more the propellant and the oxidizer sloshes around, the more difficult it is to control the vehicle. And if the vehicle, of course, goes completely out of control, then you need to blow it up before it becomes a danger. So what do you do in order to reduce propellant slosh? Because obviously you're going to have at least some propellant in the tanks if you're going to be bringing the booster back. In fact, it's going to be very rare that you don't have a situation where the tank is completely full. Well, one method to control the effects of propellant slosh, and this is something that is used in just about every type of fuel tank, including fuel tanks for ships, LNG tanks, etc., are propellant slosh baffles. And now this is something that's widely used in most types of fuel tanks. It's a passive control which dissipates the energy of the sloshing motion of fuel by segmenting the fuel field of the tank into a number of subflow fields. As you can see from these particular types of baffles, that's the kind of effect it would have. It disrupts the flow of the propellant, therefore reducing the effect of the slosh. And contrary to popular belief and contrary to some of the rumors that have been circulating around on the internet, Starship actually does have at least some slosh baffles in its tanks. We've seen this very clearly during some of the earlier tests of Starship. However, these baffles have proven to be problematic in some cases. Number one, they add considerable weight to the rocket. And number two, sometimes the, these baffles act as a bridge, allowing certain types of liquids to get into your propulsion system that you don't want to be there. This actually happened or was suspected to have happened with the SN10 launch. SN10 experienced some problems with with its propulsion system during flight, especially during the flip maneuver, and it got some helium into its propulsion system, helium bubbles, which inhibited some of its performance and some of its engine efficiency. This may have led Elon Musk to abandon certain types of propellant baffles to use other types, which haven't proven to be all that effective either. This could be something that could take a considerable amount of time to rectify. If if the baffles are indeed not doing their job or producing certain types of side effects while they're doing their job, 
then they're going to have to experiment with other types of propellant baffles in order to reduce slosh. However, this may not be what's causing the issue either. During the separation process, it has been calculated that Starship may have gone into a negative G acceleration. That is to say, when the engines on the orbiter ignited, blasting straight down into the booster, the booster stopped accelerating forward and it uses G forces in order to feed propellant into the propulsion system for a brief period of time. If the booster was no longer accelerating because of the hot stage separation, it would be sucking in gas instead of liquid. Rocket propulsion systems don't do well when they're sucking in gas instead of liquid. And so consequently, we may have had a failure of the propulsion system as a result of the hot stage separation, not because of damage, but because of G-force, or rather the lack of G-forces. But to give you an idea of just how much data SpaceX is having to analyze right now, I'm going to quote one of my team members who has worked in the industry for a considerable amount of time. Now, of course, he can only speculate as to how much data there is, but he's guessing that there's terabytes per launch based on multi-channel S-band dishes at Starbase and the WB-57 surveillance aircraft from NASA, probably several hundred streams of kilohertz samples from a variety of instruments on board, and that's outside of video. What the mishap investigation, and keep in mind, yes, there's the mishap investigation that the FAA is now undergoing. They have to walk the se sequence of events from start to finish, looking for linear chains of circumstances that led to the outcome, then going back through them all over again, looking for opportunities for it to come out differently. That's why it's not an accident investigation. The upfront assumption is that there is no act of God or randomness to it. It is completely understandable, which means all that data needs to be analyzed and the causes of what happened during OFT2 have to be clearly quantified. If, after looking at the data, SpaceX is able to clearly and consistently reconstruct what happened, and it was one of the things in their pre-flight predictions that was discussed and maybe had mitigation applied, then SpaceX can can make the case that they understand their rocket and can operate it safely. At that point, no harm, no foul, maybe a discussion about additional mitigations if new branches and sequels are identified beyond what was originally estimated. In other words, if maybe there are some additional ways to make it safer, then those things need to be implemented before the FAA lets it fly again. Getting to that point requires sifting through that terabyte of data and matching it with the design and pre light models. Several weeks to get that done, assuming there's no mysteries to solve. If there are mysteries to solve, then it'll definitely take longer because SpaceX has to go back and come up with a convincing estimate of what happened. I don't think we're looking at that kind of situation, but it's entirely possible that they're struggling to explain the loss of Starship. Fundamentally, it's all about the pre-flight predictions. If the flight fits, one of the many predictions, even the unhappy ones and the mitigations worked, then there was never a safety danger that wasn't accounted for in the plan. That is easy, routine, and largely pro forma. However, if the flight did not match, then there's a lot more math to do. It's also worth it to keep in mind that at a fundamental level, the FAA does not give a rat's ass about Starship and Super Heavy being a good rocket or even a good idea. All they care about is if SpaceX is only breaking their own stuff and not injuring people. The FAA and MESAP investigations are not in the business of making Starship a better rocket, only one that can be operated safely. I suspect then, at the very least, SpaceX is going to have to investigate what happened, make sure that they are absolutely positive that that is indeed what happened, that they've identified each and everything that caused the flight to fail, and then they need to implement whatever corrective actions they possibly can to rockets that are already largely completed, which isn't going to be an easy thing to do at all. Then, and only then, is the FAA going 
going to grant permission to launch, and there's no way in hell that's going to happen before next year. And if SpaceX were to somehow try to launch before then, all that would happen is another destroyed booster and another destroyed Starship, and not a whole lot of progress made. I really don't think that anyone's going to go forward with that, regardless of what decisions the FAA makes. So when do you think Starship is going to launch again? Put it in the comments. Give me a date. Whoever comes closest to the actual date is going to win a piece of Starbase. Now, you get a certain number of guesses based on the type of viewer you are, although I'm going to give everybody a guess. Everybody gets a chance. If you're a subscriber, you get one guess. If you are a Patreon member, either at the basic level or at the Crew Dragon level, then you get two guesses. If you're a Patreon level at anything higher than that, then you get three guesses. Please make sure that you include your Patreon ID. And if you are a YouTube member, an angry advocate in other words, well, you get two guesses as well. And that's something I'll be able to tell right off the bat. Good luck to all of you. And of course, we'll do the giveaway on the date that Starship actually launches next year or who knows. Christmas time. I've been wrong about these sorts of things before, although I really don't think I'm wrong about this one. Thanks again for watching. Please like, please subscribe. Also, please consider supporting me either on Patreon or as a YouTube member. All the details are in the description so I can go out and cover more of these launches. And as always, guys, stay angry about space. <laughs>